So take a look around. What do you have that God hasn't given you? Every heartbeat, every breath, every good and perfect gift comes from Him. He is the ultimate giver. He literally gives us gifts that we can't comprehend. Think about this. There are more electrical impulses generated in one day by a single human brain cell than by all the telephones in the world. Or how about the fact that food tastes delicious? It didn't have to taste delicious. It could have all tasted like kale, but no, it's fantastic. We plan our day around good tasting food. God gave us this. And then there's our health. We're not healthy because we deserve it. We didn't jump in a 55 gallon drum of yogurt and spinach. Our health is a gift, a gift that is too often taken for granted. God has always given to me knowing that he would get little in return. He is a father that enjoys giving good gifts to his children. I've heard it said that it's possible to give without loving, but you can never love without giving. And that is his example. For God so loved the world that he gave. Like most people, I'm often driven by what I don't have when I should be driven to seek the heart of God. Because God's heart is revealed in his generosity. Maybe my heart is too. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, where it says, Don't let anyone deceive you. Uh, Christ will not come again until the great apostasy takes place, and the man leading the global rebellion against God's law is exposed. He will exalt himself by opposing all those who truly worship God. He will set himself up in the midst of the church and speak for God as if he is or were God. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Uh, 
Normally, on Memorial Day weekend, we have kind of a patriotic uh, Memorial Day sermon or talk. But we're going to uh, continue our topic on the sign or the mark, talking about the mark of the beast. Um, and we're, we're not going to quite get that far today, but we're going to find out some more things. We're, we're going kind of slowly. So this is the series, and this is part two of that series. And uh, last time we met, I spoke about the Lord's Day as the Sabbath, which is marked out plainly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it says the Son of Man, and this is Jesus speaking, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And the reason I bring that up is because a lot of people jump on uh, Revelation chapter uh, where it talks about uh, the Lord's Day, and people have taken that to be Sunday, the first day. But uh, the Lord's Day is actually the Sabbath, the seventh day, the seventh day of the week. We did not really establish what the sign is. We did establish what the Sabbath was, but we didn't establish what the sign's talking about. Um, so let's take a moment and discuss uh, what is meant by the sign in this title, the sign or the mark. The title is followed by a question mark. You can see that uh, it's followed by a question mark there. And, and so that question could, could be um, spoken in a lot of different ways. Uh, you, can t you can say stuff like, uh, is the sign um, uh, a mark? Or uh, what is it that happened? What, what is the sign? What's the mark? Uh, or it could be read, would you like to live under the sign or the mark? Or how about putting it this way, is there a difference between the sign or the mark? Before we get to the subject of the sign, I need to say that most Christians listening today to the pastor, including me, uh, or the priest or the elder of their church, whoever's speaking, most people going, most Christians will go to church every week and listen to uh, the person speaking and never go home and open the Bible or some commentary to see if what they said is true. They, they just accept it, and they go on with life. And I got to tell you, there are some preachers that, that uh, you know, uh, misspeak or maybe intentionally lead their church astray. And uh, we, need to, we need to check up on those people. Uh, we need to find out if what they're saying is true. I ask that you take down, uh, maybe, uh, maybe purchase a, a, a trustworthy commentary or maybe two or three commentaries and uh, find out what key words mean in the Greek and the Hebrew and the culture in which they were spoken, uh, you know, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Uh, many pastors and priests are either ignorant or leading their uh, churches astray. Very early in the history of the world, God spoke to Moses. Moses was really the first and great leader of uh, the Israelites, the Jews. And he spoke to Moses in Exodus 31. And he said to Moses, say to the people, most importantly, remember to keep the Sabbath holy because it is a very special day for me. That's God talking about himself. And it's a day of rest for you. It's a sign between, there it is. It's a sign between you and me for all time to show that you are the people whom I have chosen and set apart. It is to be a permanent sign between us, because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and by the seventh day he had finished everything. He then rested in the joy of what he had made. Exodus 31. Here's how most Christians would respond to those verses. They would say, well, sure, God meant it for his people, and those people were the Jews back in the Old Testament. He meant it for them, of course. Uh, allow me to, to read a couple of uh, verses later on about from the New Testament that uh, tells us that the Sabbath was still. I'm going to teach you a couple of lessons. First of all, notice once again for the tenth time since I've started this series that I have said it, the Sabbath was created hundreds of years before there was a Jew. It just, 
uh, hundreds of years. The Sabbath was created for us. It was, for, it was created for mankind. The second lesson comes to us from the book of Galatians. Paul wrote beginning with verse 26 in Galatians 3, You are sons and daughters of God through your faith union with the Lord Jesus Christ. All who are baptized into this faith union with Christ also commit themselves to live the life of Christ. No longer is there any spiritual difference between Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, or males and females. I want to point out here that it said no spiritual difference. When you get to males and females, I'm sure that there are people that read into that and say, yeah, you see, there's no difference. Well, that's stupid. All of us are on the same spiritual level. It's talking about our spiritual lives. Uh, on the same spiritual level because of our union with Christ. Uh, here is where Paul tells you and me that uh, we are spiritual Jews. We are spiritual Israel. Uh, if we have accepted Jesus into our lives and our hearts. In the New Testament, the same Israel, the name Israel not only applies to the Jews, but also to Paul's Gentile converts. The word Gentile means a person who has become a Christian but uh, was, was never a Jewish, didn't accept the Jewish faith. Listen to the words to the rest of the portion of this portion of the Bible. It, uh, it says, now if you belong to Christ, then you're a descendant of Abraham. You are a descendant of Abraham. And you're entitled to everything that God promised him. So that means that we are spiritual Jews. We're spiritual Israel when we accept Jesus as part of our life. So in the New Testament, the name Jew or Israelite not only applies to Jesus, but also to those who are born in Christ, who have been reborn. In other, in other words, all true Christians are now God's spiritual Israel. I've said that about four times already this morning. This is an important point when it comes to the sign or the mark. Ezekiel was a prophet in God's, to God's people during the time of the Babylonian captivity. So here they were, they were in Babylon, and uh, he's a contemporary really of Jeremiah and Isaiah. Uh, Daniel was there. Uh, he, he's also given dreams. Uh, Ezekiel was given dreams just like Daniel was. And the dreams came from God as a way to let the prophet know about the fate of his people. At this point in the book of Ezekiel, God is not pleased with the Israelites because they've kind of turned their back on him. They're worshiping other gods and they're falling into the same habits that all of these, uh, these other nations are falling into. And he's not happy with the Israelites. Uh, and he's, and he, uh, he's chastising them right here. Uh, so how, how have they done that? God rehearses a bit of the, of the history that he has led these Israelites through. And he uh, tells them, so I brought them out of bondage into the wilderness to be with me and to make them into a better people. There I gave them my laws and my commandments, which bring life to those who keep them. I also told them that the Sabbath would be a sign of the bond between us to remind them that I am the Lord their God and that I am the one who set them apart and made them a holy people. The fact is that there are many Old Testament Bible verses that talk about the sign. It's a sign between God and his people. And, and it, uh, it, it goes over and over that, that sign in the Old Testament in different verses. The book of Acts was written by Luke. Now we're going to the New Testament. The book of Acts was written by Luke. It was written around between 61 and 64 A.D. And that's like 30 years after the death of Jesus. In Acts 17, we read these words. From Philippi, Paul and Silas traveled in a southwesterly direction and then headed west to Thessalonica because there was a synagogue there. Following his usual practice, Paul went to the synagogue and for the next three Sabbaths discussed with the people the meaning of the prophecies about the Messiah. 
So the important part there is that for the next three Sabbaths, he went and spoke in the synagogue. So we need to discover what happened to the Sabbath between that early church in Acts and later on in, in history. And a lot of this things that we'll be discussing now will be history as well as Bible. Uh, we, need to, we, we know the Sabbath was a sign between God and his people clear up through the Christian church in the book of Acts, 61 to 64 AD. Was there any indication that something was going on then in the early church uh, concerning the Sabbath day in that very first uh, century church? From the Apostle Paul, God's people are warned about something treacherous, and stealthy that was happening. Something was happening already. It was something happening even in Paul's day. He tells us, his people, that uh, to, be, to be on the lookout for, for somebody. And he calls him the man of sin. Be on the lookout. Second Thessalonians 2, Paul writes, Don't let anyone deceive you. This is part of our scripture reading. In any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, King James calls it the, the man of sin, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Uh, does that sound like the devil? Does it sound like Satan? It does, doesn't it? It sounds like Satan, right out of Isaiah and Ezekiel, who described the devil uh, because the devil was, you know, trying to lift himself up, trying to make himself. Uh, I want to tell you that that description was not of the devil. It was of an entity that's controlled by the devil, but it wasn't from the devil. Uh, it says in, uh, as we go on in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 through 9, it says, this mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This was at work in Paul's day and will continue to spread until the one behind it is exposed and taken out of the way. The man who opposes God's law will be seen for what he is and the Lord will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and by the brightness of his coming. All that this man will do will be in accordance with the work of the devil. And the devil will also come and display his power by working miracles and all kinds of signs and wonders. We've got to be ready for some of the stuff that's coming on. Uh, if this entity is controlled by the devil, it's no wonder that this entity speaks just like the devil speaks. Uh, Lucifer, it says in Isaiah 14, Lucifer was full of pride and said to himself, I will set my throne in the heavens. I will take charge of the stars of God. What's the stars of God? The angels, the messengers. He's going to take charge. And he did. A, a full third of them were told. I will sit next to God on the sacred mountain in the north from which he governs the universe. I will dwell in the highest heaven far above the clouds. I will be like the, the Almighty, the most high God. But he was cast out of heaven. Satan was cast out of heaven. So Lucifer, who is known as Satan and and uh, the devil and the dragon and the serpent in the Garden of Eden, remember that, was thrown out of heaven. And we know that he came to this earth with a third of the stars of heaven or the angels that fell with him. The book of Revelation makes this uh, point very clear in uh, chapter 12. It says, this controversy between God and the dragon began years ago in heaven. God's son, Michael, and the loyal angels fought against the dragon and his angels. The dragon and his angels fought back, but were defeated and lost their place in heaven. The great dragon called the devil and Satan, that ancient serpent who is leading the whole world astray, was thrown out of heaven and came down to this earth with his angels. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. So 
we see uh, what's going on here, that the uh, devil has been cast out of heaven. He is not happy about what has happened. Um, and uh, I, I need to tell you that now we're going to get into some of the um, history behind all of the things that are happening. Uh, we know that Satan was not in good sorts being cast out of heaven. We also know that Satan cannot appear to most people in his in his um, what in his guise. He has to be disguised. He has to he has to come as something else. You know that he can turn himself into an angel of light, but he can also turn himself into anything that he wants to. Uh, we know that Satan can make himself that angel. He he can make himself a friendly serpent, like he did in the Garden of Eden. And he could even make the, the serpent talk. Or a relative, he can make himself into a relative. Did you know that? A relative of yours. He can, he can deceive you that way. He can make himself into a prophet as he did to King Saul. When King Saul went to the, the witch of Endor and wanted to bring up Samuel, who had been dead for several years. And here comes this, uh, this uh, ghost-like figure. And uh, King Saul thought for sure that it was Samuel. The devil can do that. The devil does that. He can fake us out with these kinds of miracles. This witch being used by Satan caused this figure to come out of the ground. Paul gave a message of warning to the people of, uh, of his day that the work of the blasphemy was already present. The work of blasphemy. And that it would come not from the outside, but from inside the church. Huh. Acts 20. I want to read that to you in just a moment. And just like clockwork, just like clockwork, not long after Paul and the, apost the apostles and Jesus were gone, that early church was gone, the work started. Satan started um, uh, what multiplying and, and expounding his miracles. It says in Acts chapter 20, watch out for yourselves. And for the sheep, it's talking to the pastors now. Watch out for yourselves and for the sheep in your church. The Holy Spirit has selected you to be their shepherds and to care for them and feed them because they are the Lord's property, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I'm gone, <laughs> wolves will come in among you and attack the sheep. Even from within your own group, men will begin to teach unscriptural things. And there will always be some who believe what such men say, and they will follow them. Um, about 100 years before Christianity, 100 B.C., the Egyptians introduced this festival of Sunday because they worshipped the sun. As a matter of fact, the Egyptians, when they buried uh, a person in, in one of those uh, pyramids, uh, they, they, they prayed or they, they thought that this person would go up into the sun and be part of uh, the sun for the rest of their existence. Um, and so they worshipped the sun, and they, they brought that into uh, the Christian church just a little bit at a time. Uh, then later, as Christianity grew, church leaders... Church leaders wanted to increase the number of people attending their churches, and they began to accept some of the uh, pagan ideas so that some of these pagan people would come into the church. And slowly, slowly, it began to expand, and pretty soon the church was filled with all kinds of pagan uh, uh, things going on. Uh, so to make the gospel more attractive to non-Christians, little pagan customs began to take over, uh, praying to sacred pools, for instance. They, they prayed to a certain pool for healing or whatever. Uh, Easter bunnies and Easter eggs, Christmas trees. Uh, Halloween and ashes. Uh, I don't know where, where all this stuff came from, but evidently from pagan customs. The custom of Sunday worship was welcomed by Christians because, for one, they did not want to be identified with the Jews who had so much to do with the death of Jesus. So the first day of the week began to be recognized as both a religious, uh, religious day, a religious celebration, as well as a civil holiday. And by the end of the 2nd century A.D., that's 300, 
Christians considered it a sin to work on Sunday, to work on the first day. The Roman emperor named Constantine was a sun worshiper, a sun worshiper. He professed conversion, he, and I underlined and, and uh, boldened the word professed because it was just, he professed it. It really wasn't a heart thing. He just professed it. Uh, and because he professed it, many of the Christians became uh, Sunday worshipers because Constantine was a Sunday worshiper, and he brought that into the church. He uh, professed that he was a Christian, uh, probably for political political reasons, political uh, advantage. He simply professed conversion. It wasn't really a hard thing. Constantine named himself bishop of the Catholic Church and enacted the first civil law regarding Sunday observance in A.D. 321. Remember that date, A.D. 321. That was a big part of the change of the Sabbath. His proclamation went like this. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture in agricultural work, may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain growing or for vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. Um, you have to understand what is going on here. Uh, it, it's kind of uh, wishy-washy. Well, if you're a farmer... Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. But God said, no, you don't even plant and you don't harvest on the Sabbath day. And we need to understand that God blessed them. God blessed them even more when they obeyed his commandments. They, they, had, they had all kinds of successful uh, success with their crops. Notice that Constantine's law did not mention the Sabbath, but referred to a mandated rest the uh, venerable day of the sun. How considerate that he was um, to mention that they could ob observe this Sunday at their convenience. You know, the farmers could, didn't have to. Remember that God had the power to bless those people who kept his laws, who kept the Sabbath. Um, when they honored him by observing the commandments, Constantine did not have that power. Constantine couldn't bless them if they obeyed, you know, kept Sunday. Uh, the church leaders must have noticed this wishy-washy handling of the observance of the holiday because it was just four years later in 325 A.D. that Pope Sylvester officially named Sunday the Lord's Day. Imagine the Pope, a person, a man born of a woman, uh, taking the place of God and naming another day as the Sabbath. And he called it the Lord's Day, which is weird because we found out early today that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, not Sunday. What business does the Pope have in naming a day the Lord's Day? This is up to the Lord and already discovered that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Mark 2.28. Mark was a Jew, so we know that he meant the Sabbath when he said uh, the Lord's Day. We cannot leave history out of our study of God's word. There are names in history books that fill, that fill in what is left out of the Bible, of course, because uh, they came later in history. Uh, in 338 AD, it was Eusebius, who was a court bishop of Constantine, who wrote the following concerning the fake power that he gave to himself. He said, all things whatsoever that is that it was a duty to do on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, we, that is Constantine, and me, that is Eusebius, and other bishops have transferred to the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, as more appropriately belonging to it. So it's interesting the way it just kind of slowly came in, and this is like 300 now, 325 A.D., so it took several uh, uh, you know, centuries. So we see that here, instead of living humble lives with self-sacrifice like the apostles, 
these so-called church leaders took it upon themselves to put themselves in the place of God. Now, in 1 John 4, verse 3, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So Antichrist was already in the world. That is something that was against Jesus. There's a truly remarkable contrast between the way God announced his commandments and the way Constantine announced his. When God announced his commandments, it was from a mountain, and there was lightnings, and there was thunderings, and everybody heard. Constantine was kind of uh, shifty, kind of, uh, you know, uh, sneaky. Well, it was unannounced. It was unnoticed. It was anticlimactic. But the church gradually adopted, gradually adopted Sunday at the command of the Christian emperor. So um, uh, the Roman and the Roman bishops. These men freely admit that they made the change from Sabbath to Sunday. <laughs> Just listen to them talk about it from the catechism of Catholic doctrine. Which day is the Sabbath day? The answer, from them. And this is in the uh, catechism. You can find this in the catechism. The Roman Catholic catechism, I'm telling you. Which day is the Sabbath? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Now listen to this. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, AD 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Uh, others, why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? The Church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday and the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on a Sunday. So, Jesus didn't resurrect from the grave and say, okay, everything's changed. We're going to worship on Sunday now because I resurrected on Sunday. He never said that. <laughs> Others, by what authority did the church substitute Sunday for Saturday? <laughs> the answer, the church substituted Sunday for Saturday by the by the plenitude of that divine power which Jesus Christ bestowed upon her. I never heard of that. I never heard of any power from the Holy Spirit or from God that descended on any church and gave them the power to start changing commandments around. Uh, question, has the Catholic Church power to make any alterations in the commandments of God? Answer, Instead of the seventh day and other festivals appointed by the old law, <laughs> the church has prescribed the Sundays and holy days to be set apart for God's worship. And these we are now obligated to keep in consequence of God's commandment instead of the ancient Sabbath. Isn't it too bad that the Sabbath is ancient? I just hate that part. It's just, I love that part really. I love the part that the Sabbath is ancient. It's been uh, all through. The Catholic Christian instructed in the sacraments, the sacrifices and the ceremonies and observances of the church by way of question and answer. Wow. Uh, they uh, willy-nilly change it. Here's another question and answer. How prove you that the church hath power to command feasts and holy days by the very act of changing the Sabbath to Sunday, which Protestants allow of? And therefore, they fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly. Now listen to this. This is the reason why. And breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. I'll prove you that. Because by keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the church's power to ordain feasts and to command them under sin. And by not keeping the rest of the feast by her commandment, they again deny, in fact, the same power. So they accept the Sunday, but they deny all the other things that the Catholic Church has set up. Ah, that's coming later. Uh, we have just scratched the... I have so many quotes and so many uh, uh, sources for this, for this particular topic, the Mark of the Beast, that uh, I probably will never come to the end of them. But uh, we'll, we'll conclude there for today, and we'll continue next week 
uh, we, we're, we're sort of setting the Sabbath up as, as, as the sign. But what is the mark? We'll get into that as we go. And who, who is the beast that owns that mark? If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray. If my people which are called by my name shall seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven then i will hear from heaven then will i hear from heaven give, forgive their sin. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray. I will forgive their sin. I will forgive their sin. I will forgive their sin. are called by my name shall humble themselves humble themselves humble themselves and